I want to share with you my personal, but it's not only the personal. I know a lot of people hope hold this case and reasons for total abstinence from alcohol, wine, and beer. Number one, alcohol does not deliver what it promises. A member of Alcoholics Anonymous wrote this letter to a columnist and senders. People drink to escape problems, but they multiply. People drink for freedom, but they become slaves. People drink to forget, but get forever haunted. People drink to feel heavenly, but they end up being hellish. People drink to strike up a conversation, but they have slurred speech. People drink for confidence, but become doubtful. People drink for bravery, but become afraid. People drink for relaxation, but start shaking. People drink for strength, but become weak. The whole idea what alcohol sells. Alcohol simply will fail to deliver on its promises. The second reason that I abstain from alcohol, and I would encourage you to do, to, to do as well, is that God does not lead us into evil. He delivers us from it. I've seen so many people be delivered from the grip of alcoholism. And many of them started with just drink, with just a drink that lead to another drink. Many addicts started with the social drinking. Nobody became an addict by becoming an addict. They first became just simply people who allowed alcohol and then they couldn't control it. It controlled them. It ruined them, took their license, threw them in jail, ruined their background, caused difficulties and problems. And in many cases, it actually opened the door to demons. And then the power of God would come and deliver them through repentance and sometimes even counseling, they would be delivered. So why would you want to put yourself in the place where you can be vulnerable for the demonic attack, for the stronghold of alcohol to occupy you and then honestly become a habitual generational curse? Alcohol directly attacks the brain. God wants us to connect and worship Him with our mind. And alcohol interferes with that because it attacks your brain. And God can no longer communicate with you because your brain now is under attack and under influence. Third reason that I don't drink is I can't have a sober mind if I don't have a sober body. In Titus chapter 1, verse 8, the Bible says that I have to have a sober mind. In order to have a sober mind, I have to pay a price to be sober in my body. You can't have a good mind if you are allowing all kinds of toxins and poison into your body. As we have looked in Proverbs that alcohol, abuse of alcohol is a sting of a serpent. It releases poison. If you don't believe me, then why do you throw up? The next day after you get drunk, you put poison and your body vomits it out. So why would you want to put things into your body that's poisonous? And many doctors will tell you the consumption of alcohol leads to diseases and sicknesses. A lot of people go in then for deliverance and for healing. You could have prevented that if you would have simply made a decision to abstain from alcohol completely. You don't miss on anything. We have actually clean water. We have very good water in the places that most of us live. We have other refreshing drinks that don't mess with your brain, that don't become addictive and that don't cause poison in your body. Number four, alcohol is a numbing mechanism. It's not nurturing as we've seen that alcohol numbs our senses. But a lot of people drink because honestly, they're trying to numb their pain. Alcohol is not your medicine. And therefore, if you remove it as a place of medicine, many of you, you will never see the need for it. I have a medicine and that medicine is my relationship with God. If I have a physical problem, I'm going to go to a doctor. I don't want beer, alcohol to try to fix a problem that is spiritual in nature, that requires good rest, that requires community and that requires confession and that requires maybe little medical intervention. Don't allow alcohol to numb your loneliness. Don't allow that because you're turning it into an idol and every idol will always disappoint its worshiper. Alcohol, number five, is a substitute for spirit-filled life. The more alcohol you have, the less Holy Spirit you have. The more alcohol you need, the less Holy Spirit you need. The Bible says do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, one of the reasons I believe in the Old Testament people have allowed wine is because they didn't have good water, but a lot of them did not have a new wine called the Holy Spirit. If you have the wine of the Holy Spirit living inside of you, you don't need the other one. We have a good water. And I'm not saying that if you drink, that is not my place, that you committed a sin if you took a glass of wine. But I want to encourage you to live as a Nazarite, to live fully dedicated, body, soul and mind, to the things of God and live your life depending on the Holy Spirit depend on the power of the Holy Spirit. I remember talking to this young pastor who was a part of a church and he says this church had a very strong stance against alcohol. 
mainly among their leadership and their members. There are certain house rules and certain culture that every church has and standards. And with time, they started to kind of become more loose. People started to drink, social drinking, nothing was addressed. And he says, the more alcohol got into the team, social drinking got into the team, less prayer started to take place in church. At the time that I was meeting with him, he was honestly broken. And he said, Vlad, we don't have any prayer at all. There is no moving of the Holy Spirit. He said, the church still has pretty decent size. He said, the pastoral team, the core team are sipping saints. He said, they get wasted drunk. And he said, how do I know that? Because the students that he said that I disciple work at these restaurants and they let me know that the pastoral team gets physically dragged out of restaurants. So it went from, it's okay to drink to now being drunk. You know, that's people who do that don't inherit the kingdom of God. And why do we do that? It's because we start with social drinking. We start with, hey, it's okay to drink. It's a very slippery slope. The enemy will try to, try to push you further and further. I'm not talking about legalism. I'm talking about a lifestyle that's so full of the Holy Spirit. You don't need an alcohol. I heard one preacher said the alcohol is the devil in the liquid form. For many people, that is the case. Number six, the Holy Spirit leads me to self-control. Alcohol takes away my control. The fruit of the Spirit is self-control. When you don't have walking in the Holy Spirit, when you, when you don't live in the Holy Spirit, you will have no self-control. Guess what's going to happen when you consume alcohol? You lose control. You begin to have something else control you. And that's not a sign of a Spirit-filled life. Now, whether you go to heaven or not, that's not my place here to say. That's between you and God. But are you a disciple? No. Because a disciple denies himself. A disciple doesn't cater to his flesh. A disciple crucifies his flesh with his passions and desires. A disciple lives crucified life, not carnal life. And therefore, while we can take different portions of the Old Testament and even the New Testament and kind of fit them into our lifestyles, there is not one verse in the Bible that will justify life of drunkenness. Drunkenness condemns somebody into being, not inheriting the Kingdom of God. The fruit of the Spirit is self-control. The life of a disciple is the one of self-denial. It's the one of carrying the cross. And I believe that in the area of drinking is one of the best areas where you can begin to put it to practice and see tremendous benefits on your health, on your relationships and on your journey with God. Many sipping saints become sleeping saints. Their spiritual life goes to sleep. Why? They don't depend on the Holy Spirit. They don't live crucified life. They depend on alcohol and they live carnal life. Number seven, sipping saints become sleeping saints. What I mean by that is alcohol always leads to other things. It doesn't stay with alcohol. Look at the Proverbs. Rewatch the what I mentioned about Proverbs. Where alcohol leads is other stuff. I can't tell you how many confessions I've heard were young girls who lost their virginity. That would have never happened if they would have not been drunk. People who put themselves in really bad places because they were drunk. People who lost their license because they were drunk. People who attempted murder because they were drunk. Sipping leads to slipping. Number eight, drunkens do not inherit the kingdom. And Bible doesn't define what it means to be drunk. It's in my best interest not to see how close to the line I can get before I fall, but to stay as far from the line as I possibly can. Meaning the goal is not to see how much of sin or how close to sin I can get without falling. The goal is how close to Jesus I can be. So I don't need to think about those things. So I don't need to be drawn and lured by those things. Because the issue of being drunk is so bad and portrayed in both Old and New Testament. It is the best not to try to find that line where Bible doesn't define it. It's best to completely walk away from that and focus on God instead of entertaining something that could land you in some waters you don't want to be in. Number nine, my sipping can cause someone's tripping. There are people who struggled with alcohol. If I will drink a glass of wine and maybe it will never lead to anything, but for them, this will become a tripping point that will cause them to sin. Now, some of you will say, well, I'm not going to be letting somebody else's problem controls my liberties. Actually, that's what love requires, is that your liberties are put on restraints by other people's weaknesses. Romans chapter 14, verse 21 says, if it offends my brother, I won't eat this. I won't drink that. That means that my liberties are restricted by other people's problems, other people's issues. Why? Because that's what love requires. I don't live for myself. I live for God and I live for people. And therefore, I know people in our team 
who were delivered from alcohol, if they were to see alcohol in my house, if they were to see me drink and let's say I had a glass of wine, this would cause a well of passive lad does it, I can do it. The only issue is that the glass would very quickly turn to a bottle and then to a bucket and they would be back to where God delivered them, in jail, with the DUI and back in sin. And I have responsibility as a believer to help other believers walk in purity and be sober. And I got to put restrictions on my liberties. Why? Because that's what love requires. Number 10, what leaders do in moderation, their people do in excess. A lot of people will say, well Vlad, you know, I'm not against um, drinking, I'm against being drunk. I do it in moderation, in social gatherings. Your conviction, your life. I'm presenting to you mine and I want to encourage you to join me in this. We must understand as people who influence others, mom, dad, brothers, mentors, what you do in moderation, people will do in excess. You have an influence over others and therefore use that influence wisely. God has entrusted you with that influence so that you will lead people further to Christ, not away from Christ, into culture, into compromise and into sin. As I've mentioned on different things already concerning these restraints and concerning these things, I want to invite you to be drunk with the Spirit, filled with the Holy Ghost, live a crucified life. I want you to embrace a life that is sacrificial, a life that's booming and beaming with light, with the presence of God. Maybe you're watching this and you're still not convinced. Can I ask you a question? Why are you so defensive for alcohol? Why do you need alcohol? Is Jesus not enough? Is the Holy Spirit not enough? Thank you.